Hi there and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's APMG webinar. I'm Estelle hicks Bennett, and I'll be your host and moderator today. You're in for a treat as always since I'm joined by regular guest, presenter and change thought leader, Melanie Franklin. Many of you will already be familiar with her background, but for the benefit of those that aren't, Melanie's an experienced practitioner, trainer and consultant in all things agile, project, program and change management, as well as playing a huge part in the Change Management Institute's UK chapter and has a time consuming habit of championing her candidates to achieve bigger and better things. In today's webinar, Melanie will draw from the latest training in change management and will provide guidance on how to deal with the current challenges we have, but most importantly, how to deal with what's coming next. I was fascinated by the then and now blog you wrote, Melanie, which identified the ways in which we've all had to change already. And it made me feel good just acknowledging how far we've come. So maybe we can share that afterwards. I know it's going to be an information packed production as always, but before I hand over, I'll quickly run through the housekeeping. The webinar is recorded and we'll share the recording and slides with you via email afterwards. Uh, please do ask questions and comment throughout the webinar. Don't wait till the end, but we will address the questions at the end because uh, sometimes those questions pop up as you're watching. And please do take part in the poll questions as it helps Melanie adapt the content to make sure it's as relevant as possible throughout the webinar. Finally, we welcome your feedback. It helps us uh, to make sure you get the content that you want. So Melanie, welcome and over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to start this webinar. It's about change management. So we are definitely going to talk about the current context for change management. Um, I'm leading um, a couple of initiatives globally uh, during this lockdown period. Um, I'm living in Spain where the lockdown has been very severe. Um, I'm online for 10 to 14 hours a day um, trying to exemplify virtual leadership. So there's lots of challenges that we're all experiencing and I'm in the same boat as everybody else. Um, but I wanted to reflect on on what that's doing in terms of the world of change management. Um, I also want to reflect what change management actually means to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and then I'm going to look at where we go now in terms of skills development and the benefits around um, getting uh, an internal capability for managing change. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what eight APMG has done in launching the Agile Change Agent qualification um, to, to explain where that is sort of fitting into the, this gap of skills that we have. Um, I'm not going to do a big sales presentation, so don't panic. Um, I'm, as usual, going to share thoughts and comments and trends, um, but I will do um, a couple of minutes at the end where I do talk about the qualification specifically. Um, now, as many of you know, when I start these webinars, I like to try to tailor what I'm saying to what's relevant. So uh, we've got a poll question um, that Estelle is just putting up right now uh, about the role that you play in change management. So if you could just let me know the kind of roles that I've got, um, she'll read the results out in just a moment. And then that helps me in thinking about who I'm talking to, kind of gets me to know you as well, which is nice, um, especially as we're <laughs> not sharing video at the moment. So lots of activity going on, lots yeah. of activity. So um, and, and the other thing I will point out, I have I have left the, uh, some of these open for more than one reply, just in case, Mel, and I hope that's OK. But so we've got 39 percent change transformation manager. Oh, uh, excellent. They, they keep changing. How is this possible? Uh, sorry, 37 <laughs> percent change transformation manager, 3 percent line management role, 47 percent project program professional, 16% other. Okay, well, welcome to the others, whoever you are. <laughs> if you want to put in the chat function who you, uh, what role other means to you, just that's fine, because Estelle will share that with me in just a moment. Uh, and the next one, it's the second and final one before we get onto the content, um, is whether or not you're, you've got any qualifications, because I am going to be talking about qualifications in a moment, so I just thought I'd ask, because I'm interested. Um, so. Uh, just over a third are in change and transformation, just under a half are in project and programme management. Okay, gives me something to work on. And then we're finding out about qualifications. So, yeah, just click something there just so I've got yeah. some idea of what's going on. Click, clicking what away again, one? they've got the choice of more than one, so it may come out as, uh, as more than 100%. So 13% agile, 12%. Mm -hmm. 
44% project management qualification, 42% change management qualification. Okay, all right, okay, so we're, we're, we're up to speed. We've got quite a qualified group. That'll help me with some of the remarks I put in later on. Um, so that's really useful. Um, so in terms of the agenda, the current context of change management, I think is something we ought to look at. Um, and I think, first of all, if we set the much bigger picture of what's going on, um, the first thing to say is that over the last few years, um, when it comes to sort of planning transformation and change, our strategic time frame is definitely shortening. So it, I, I did actually read a stunning um, five year plan that was written in 2018 um, for one of my clients yesterday. It was a really brilliant read, actually. It was absolutely great. Um, uh, it just it flowed. It had lots of key information in there. But it was a five year plan and it was written in 2018. Um, and in, in some respects, you, you look at it and you think, hmm, yeah, it's missing a lot of relevance and it's only two years old. And we know that that strategic time frame is going from the sort of for five years. I think a lot of us have been working in a much shorter frame of, of sort of three years. But in the last five years, I'd say that a lot of my clients are moving to a, a strategic time frame. They are talking in one to two years. Um, and when I was studying my first degree in economics, we used to talk about the, the sort of the short term being three to five years, the medium term being sort of five to 10 years and the long term being anything above 10 years. Um, and, and now, you know, we can see on this screen what it's really like. And to be fair, I think an awful lot of us right now are in the position, um, I won't name all the organisations that I've been talking to this week, but um, there is a large financial institution that has taken the decision that they are not getting staff back into their buildings uh, in the UK, um, certainly not before January. I was talking to an audit function that is not planning to get in its people back in, uh, they're not even going to have the conversation about coming back in until the beginning of September. Um, I'm working working with um, a, a professional services firm that's not doing anything till October. And of course, Google overnight started to announce that they're bringing back around 10% of their staff into buildings. Uh, and that'll go up to as high as 30% over the summer. Um, but that's about where it will sit from then on, and that 70% are moving into a, a more permanent working from home role uh, for which they're going to get um, a, a $1,000 to, to pay for sort of desk furniture and other things. So I, I think we know that there's a sort of short term sort of time frame that we're working to, and it is incredibly hard um, to sort of do any sort of planning past that. But I think something else is at foot as well which is this. Um, when we have a look at um, this sort of little visual here is to represent that not only is the shortening of the time horizon, it's been increased by the scale of amendments to our planned change. Um, what I mean by that is that um, in the recent past, five or six years ago, up to about then, um, when planning that longer term, we understood that, that there would clearly be some changes in direction to accommodate changes in the market, in, in the industry, what competitors were doing, what technology is doing, uh, the regulatory environment. But we would broadly stick to the types of initiatives we had planned. But as you notice, I think that not only is the time frame getting shortened, but at the same time, we're starting to see that um, perhaps uh, the shifts in direction to accommodate changes in the external framework uh, are also getting bigger. You can start to see that there's more wiggle room and yet more wiggle room. And then finally, this is where we are now. So um, we hear right now, I think, that an, an awful lot of organisations, even if they don't use the word pivot, um, that there is a willingness to pivot to a whole new idea if the first one isn't delivering the results they'd hoped for. Uh, and they talk about fail fast, which, you know, fail is not a great word to start a conversation with. Um, but the general idea is there is a, a great willingness these days if things are not delivering the results expected to, to cut them off and to move to something different. Um, and the reason I care about that is what the impact is. It, it's great that we are prepared to, to uh, stop something that's not working and I, identify the problem and move to a better solution. Um, but as you can see in this diagram, the, you know, we flip flap between one thing and another and the impact is that therefore there is a much higher volume of change for all of us to assimilate. 
And that change in its own right, each change has a much shorter lifespan, which I think has a bit of an impact on how motivated we are to get on board with something, because it's very much like, um, uh, well, I'd say buses, but actually it's more like trains on the Northern Line. You know, norm when normal service is running, um, you know, a couple of minutes and we get frustrated in London if we have to make wait more than two minutes for the next tube. Um, and it, it, it feels like that they're coming with that kind of frequency. And, and of course, what that does is, well, why should I bother getting motivated? You know, there'll be another change along soon enough. If I don't get on board with this one, they'll have changed it by the time I, I sort of do get on board. And of course, it incre increases the amount of uncertainty in the organisation overall. So I, I think that we need to be aware of this is the situation we're at. And I I lead a, a couple of thought leadership groups around the world um, who are, one is a CEO group and another one is a directors of transformation group. And one thing that interests me is that we are all talking about the, the fact that perhaps we're getting to that pitch where staff are really, really struggling to, to cope with the volume of change. Um, and that perhaps one of the things that we need to, to get a grip on um, is uh, that we have clarity about what we're doing when we're doing it so that people find it easier to follow what we're up to. Um, so I think there's some good portfolio management skills underneath underpinning that if we're going to get a bit of a grip. Um, I think something else that uh, I think we're sort of all aware of though is uh, on the good news side. Um, I've spoken to an awful lot of people. Um, they are in part, they are in IT, so a number of them are CIOs, uh, but some of them are directors of the transformation who've all said the same thing, that in the last 12 weeks, or certainly perhaps in the first four weeks of lockdown, they managed to achieve more um, system change that then they thought they'd actually get through in the next two to three years because the resistance was absolutely overwhelmed by the sense of urgency to make change happen. And if people weren't going to get on board with various virtual online tools, they weren't going to be able to work at all. Um, so that sense of urgency propelled a huge amount of change. Um, so new habits have actually developed. And as the lockdown in so many countries has lasted into about the three month period, which is a time at which actually things do become the new norm and it becomes the accepted practice, um, it's reducing the chance that when we do return to whatever new normal looks like, um, that we'll roll back to the old ways of working. So that's that's the good news, I think. But hopefully that gives you a sort of sense of um, what I think is happening in the, the wider context. Um, I can sort of see a flashing chat button. Um, uh, is, are there any questions or any comments that I need to be aware of, Estelle, that would help? Uh, nothing that you need to be aware of at the moment. I'm just chitty chatting in the background here, Mel. Sorry oh. about that. <laughs> there, was, there was one one lady that said on the um on the the polls that there wasn't an option for no qualification, so she wanted to highlight that, and people oh. are letting me know where they're listening from. So. Um, oh, that's uh, yeah, so we, we can go over that shortly if you like. I don't want to interrupt your flow. <laughs> no, that's no problem at all. Where are people listening from? Just so we get uh, a bit of so a we've got we've got I haven't got that bit in front of me now. It's uh, we've got New Zealand, um, which I thought what, I don't know what time of night they're listening or in in the night time. Oh, and they're they're all answering now that you've asked as well. So we've got South Africa, uh, Canada. Paris, UK. I did put in the chat to everybody else where they're calling from earlier. US. Well, I'm in Malaga, so um, uh, the US as well. Well, welcome all of you. I like a truly global webinar. Well, that's great. So, <laughs> there we go. Um, so what's going on here? So the impact on individuals is what we're worried about. And I think um, that, you know, what we need to recognise really is, is what is change management in a way. And we know that change management is, um, and I've spent an entire day talking about this with a group, it is both structural or tangible in that it is the, the project end of things. And I know that 50% of you are project and program management professionals. So it is about that creation of the whatever that new feature, new function. It could be um, a new policy, um, uh, a new uh, organization structure. It could be um, some poor chap today was <laughs> responsible for moving into a new building. Um, so it's acquiring the new building and uh, moving everybody into that. So there's the structural piece. 
But we also know that um, whatever the new thing is, so let's take the simple one, Microsoft Teams, which I imagine um, if you're not living on Teams, you're living on Zoom. Let's be honest. You know, there are two platforms that generally have won the way. Um, I know Blue Jeans is used by some tech firms, but generally speaking, Zoom and Teams is it. Um, and that's the structural piece. Um, our IT departments around the world have done a fantastic job in making sure that we have our accounts set up and we're ready to go. But of course, the behavioural stuff is how do we change our behaviours? Um, how do we get organised? How do we make things actually happen online? Um, how do I need to change how I prepare things? Um, we went into lockdown in Malaga on the Saturday night and on the Sunday, I, I'd only flown in on that Saturday morning. Um, and on Sunday morning, I started delivering workshops um, for my client in the Middle East. Um, so I had very little assimilation time. Um, and I really am at the sharp end of that dip, if you like, because that morning, if I had been delivering my workshop in a face to face situation and I was fully expecting, by the way, instead of flying home to Malaga to have flown to the Middle East on that Saturday. Um, but had I been in my um, big work room in the Middle East um, with uh, my lovely man who brings me lots, lots of uh, cups of chai um, quite regularly, lovely milky chai, um, I would have just grabbed my stuff from the hotel in the morning. I might have been a bit jet lagged, but I would have stumbled into my work room. There's my flip chart stand. Um, there's my cable to, to plug in to show my slides on the big TV screen behind me and off I go. Um, and it's all that unconscious competence that we talk about. But of course, what I had to do instead on that Sunday morning was I got up um, in the middle of the night. Um, it's still pitch black. Uh, my dog's still asleep at the, the foot of the bed um, and I'm struggling to get all of my stuff ready. I'm, I'm rehearsing things. I'm trying stuff out on Teams. I'm worried about things because it's all brand new and I'm worried about how it's all going to work. Um, and therefore, I'm learning new behaviours. I'm learning a new habit. I'm, I'm putting in place new ways of working. And of course, there was the structural stuff about getting the team's account set up. And we had some rehearsals on the Thursday when we realised that the borders had been been closed. Um, and so that project to actually make sure that the licences were in place, that we had access was one thing that was quite stressful. But it was nothing compared to the stress of trying to work out how it was all going to work. And of course, that's the thing, isn't it? That actually um, the impact on individuals is the amount of change they're subjected to at any one time. That's, an, that's one particular change. But we shouldn't forget that at the same time, you know, there's, there's not one change in town. There's multiple changes. Um, and they're all running at different um, paces, uh, all at different stages. And so what we have is that, you know, everyone is, is subject to this, these multiple changes from multiple sources. And it's not surprising, I don't think, that um, change management uh, is becoming the sort of it, it, it's almost like this is the democratization of the skill set. It's becoming such an important thing. Um, and the impact that the reason we've got to support people with an ability to lead themselves and others through change is that, you know, what's really happening through this sort of structural and behavioural piece is that there are sort of three stages where, first of all, people are going, what am I trying to live without? Uh, what's going on here? What am I trying to remember not to use? What have I got to remember not to do anymore? Um, and then. Oh, what am I practicing today? Uh, what do I need to learn today? How do I have a go at this? Uh, what if I make a mistake? How do I pick up the pieces? And then finally, right, what am I trying to bed down here? Um, what do I need to, to make sure is my absolute new habit? What's the new norm around here? Um, who do I need to tell customers, suppliers, whatever it is, um, that I'm working on the new norm? You know, so there's this this impact is that the amount of mental energy that's being required and that we really are pushing uh, people to to the ends of, of their their uh, ability to cope because that is just ratifying one particular change and at the same time of course an awful lot of people within the business are in fact their job their day job is run the business so the the majority of their time is given over to 
whatever task they do for our organization, uh, whether it's selling, whether it's servicing customers, whether it's doing the financial reporting. Um, and what we're sort of laying on top of them is they've got to find this additional time uh, to help create new ways of working. So I think there's the impact on individuals um, from not just one change, but multiple changes and the psychological impact of actually sort of what's happening to these people um, is, is absolutely huge. Um, it means I think the, the ultimate conclusion I'm drawing from this is that we need to get really good at managing change. Um, change cannot be seen as this big thing that's perhaps managed separately from day-to-day -day work. We actually need to sort of perhaps bring the two together. We need an approach that uh, enables those who are impacted and who've got the day job, um, that they can easily follow something and that they can easily sort of adapt part of their work while still delivering excellent levels of service uh, on the rest of their responsibilities. Um, so we really are, I think, at the, the forefront of saying we need to democratise change management skills. They're no longer held by a small group of professionals, but they are a core competence. They're held by everyone because everybody is impacted by change. And again, if I come back to the trends and what I'm seeing um, at the sharp end of what my clients are asking from me, um, the most important thing they're asking is um, they've, they've got their own ways of managing change. They've got their experts. They've got uh, internally, they've got their um, relationships with um, the consultancy companies that perhaps help them uh, devise the changes. I mean, obviously, the most common one these days is um, that the consultancies are working on new target operating models for nearly every organization I come across. So all of that's in place. But what they are looking for is a way in which they can easily upskill um, staff who are in the business um, that don't see themselves as being change or project management professionals to actually be able to cope, first of all, cope for themselves but also then to navigate a way through actually delivering on change. So I think that that's really the, 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 the nub of what I wanted to talk about today, because I think that's what I'm seeing. And I find it really interesting. I was talking to somebody the other day who was looking for um, a, a role in change and, and looking to sort of carve out a niche for herself about what she would offer. And, and I was just making the point that probably one of the most important things being asked for is, do you know how to set up? And you know how to support a network of change agents across a business. Um, so do you know how to transfer your ability to manage change to others? Can you build that capability in others as quickly and easily as possible? Because we must never forget they've already got a very busy day job. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about um, and make sure that my remarks sort of reflect what you think the biggest pressures are for those impacted by change at the moment. So I've asked Estelle to put this poll up um, uh -huh. because I'm starting to look at things around fatigue um, and being overwhelmed, but I'd really be interested in your thoughts as well. So let's give that a bit of a go. Okay. So uh, the answers are starting to come in. So um, and I do appreciate some of you are saying that you can't click on the poll answers. And I'm so sorry that you're not able to do that. Our apologies. I don't I don't know how to help you. <laughs> I think I, it's because you're that... from a, a mobile devices. It does mean that the polls don't work on mo mobile devices. So if you happen to be on a laptop, you're probably in the clear. Um, so uh, what have Let's we have got? So we've got eight. 18% finding the time to take part, 37% feeling fatigued by unrelenting pace of change, 30% not knowing which change to prioritise, 10% finding the time to practice new ways of working. We've got 3% other. Uh, let me have a quick check in the question. So I'm going to close the poll now. There we go. Let's have a look at those questions. Um, might be worth mentioning. Uh, that to others. Um, oh, he's saying his is is uh, he's on Windows and it's now working. Okay. All right. Okay. That's good. Uh, <laughs> sorry, being able to balance between um, work and life is the yeah. other. Yeah, balancing work life balance. Um, 
yeah and and other comments here on the uh on the polls okay that's lovely so yeah i think uh, the the other response was balancing work and life and i think that's actually um a very interesting one because um at the end of the day um i think that uh I, I've been running an informal poll for years, which is around um, how much time are people spending on their day job, the run the business day job. And you will find that um, a huge proportion of staff are spending more than 100% of their contracted hours. Um, the average seems to be 130%. Um, and so in other words, they're doing a lot of extra hours already. So when we talk about that balance between work and life, what tends to happen with change is of course that the time they need to spend spend on actually dealing with the left hand side here of trying to assimilate change um, is is from their own free time we know this don't we people come in early uh, they stay late and they work through their lunch breaks um, and I think that um, having run a more um, recent informal poll about the virtual world that we're now working on, um, there is a general view about the unrelenting pace of work because we don't have all the little social interactions which enabled us to sort of have a bit of a balance during the working day. Um, so that balance is gone. I never realised, you know, how um, my stress would go down a little bit when I sort of mooched off to the office kitchen to make a cup of tea and met colleagues in the kitchen, had a bit of a natter with them and then went back to my desk. That that gave me a sort of a bit of relief, which um, certainly um, here working from home, I don't get. Um, probably like you, I have back to back meetings all of the time. And one of the things um, that's been raised by a number of correspondents with me is that, that you know, there's there's no break times. People are, because they're booking sort of meetings on team or Zoom, they book 30 minutes or 60 minutes or two hours, forgetting that people just don't get any time in between. Um, so we've already got problems with the work-life balance because of lockdown, and we've got problems because of where people are finding the time to actually um, get involved in change to practice change and of course um, as I said more than a third of you are also concerned about that unrelenting pace of change. The only way we can help people is we need to empower them with the skills really um, and so I think the, the whole point is that we've got to do both. We've got to support individuals um, to manage change both from the sort of the structural piece um, which is, uh, and that structural piece is, is all about, um, we need things that are, in terms of uh, planning skills, for example, uh, scheduling the when change is going to happen, when they're going to, to, to make alterations to their ways of working. We really do need some skills around keeping things simple. So we're thinking about things like um, low cost, low cost of maintenance, low cost of use. So we shouldn't put in place things that require an awfully big training course for people to get to grips with. You know, if they've got to have two weeks off to be able to actually learn how to manage change, then perhaps we're doing something wrong. Um, and it should be sort of um, rooted in, in common sense, um, not full of terminology. Um, so let's keep things as, as simple, straightforward, and therefore as, as open um, and inclusive as possible. So let's make sure that things are intuitive. And by that, I mean that whatever sort of um, method or um, approach we're asking people to follow, let's make it a natural flow so that it's sort of easy to guess what comes next. Let's make things as instinctive as possible. Let's make them easy to repeat whatever sort of change is coming up. Let's make sure that we sort of democratise things so that it doesn't matter the source of the change, um, whether it's an organisational design, so we're changing the, the structure of the, the organisation, or whether or not it's uh, an IT-driven change or a regulatory-driven change. It shouldn't matter where the, the trigger for the change comes from, and it really shouldn't matter what the, the change is actually going to be, because it all ends up with the same thing, is that people have to change the way they work. They might have to prioritise pieces of work, they might do things on a different day, earlier in the day, uh, they might get rid of certain pieces of paper that they used to complete um, and actually replace that with other information that they need to gather or process. Uh, they might need to take more deliberate actions, uh, maybe spend more time talking to customers or staff. 
So whatever the, the change is, whatever its source, people still need to change their ways of working. And, and there's an in, in, there is a commonality across that. So let's make sure that whatever we're giving them as a, a method for, for actually leading change, let's make sure it's repeatable and it's applicable to all change and that, it, that it's easy to just apply. And at the same time, let's not forget that it isn't, in order to make change happen for yourself and for others, um, it really is about motivation at the end of the day and being able to persuade um, others um, and positively influence others, but also ourselves that we want to get involved in change. Um, I was doing um, uh, an activity earlier on today um, where we were looking at the benefits of a particular change. So we all took a change and we were doing a sort of mind map of all of the benefits associated with it. And I picked um, as an example of how we still need to enthuse ourselves and motivate ourselves as much as we need to motivate others. Um, I picked uh, the fact I've been doing some online training. I'm not going to name the provider because it's going awfully badly um, in that it's not interactive at all. Um, there's no society around it. So what happens is you get online, you, you access the materials for the module, you read them, you watch the odd video. The materials are a little bit out of date. You've got to um, post questions in the chat function uh, to get some of your learning points. Um, but as there's nobody else online, because only about three or four people seem to have ever taken the course, um, you have to wait a couple of weeks for somebody to actually come back with a comment. So it's not sort of in the moment. So let's be honest, it's a bit of a disastrous course, <laughs> but I've paid a lot of money for it. So let's be honest, I bought a lemon. Um, but I did actually um, think, well, come on, you've got to see this change through now. You know, you've invested in this. You've got to make it happen. Um, so I was using the techniques that I'm so busy teaching others to actually try to enthuse myself to see if I could give up some of my time to actually seeing it through um, and sort of uh, applying some resilience. So I think what we need is we need skills that people can really in, in terms of the people skills, uh, we shouldn't overlook that anything to, to help people uh, manage change is a mixture of uh, that sort of more structural um, uh, skill set, the, the planning, uh, the breaking things down, uh, the doing the analysis of, of the benefits, um, sorting out the timings of when things are gonna go live, looking at all the interdependencies, but also the, the human skills. Um, the, the, the work that we do here, we know that actually to, to make others come on board the change journey, you have to be at the top end of your emotional intelligence. Um, and I think we need to very deliberately explain how to build that emotional intelligence, that res those skills in resilience, those skills in overcoming resistance to change. Um, and I'm very much sort of thinking at this point that, that, that there is now the, the death of that assumption that leaders are born, not made. I think to a large uh, extent, we can actually go through and say, do you know what? There's a lot of things we can do here to actually make better leaders. So let's do that. Um, I wanted to um, sort of have a look at, um, first of all, structure, then to look at skills in a little bit more detail. Um, and um, the structure, I think, is, a you know, from an agile perspective, we know that change is, is agile, um, that we ought to have a, a short burst of activity that sort of maybe collects everything together that we need to, to scope the change um, and work out how we're going to organize our resources and, and, and basically govern it. But then the rest of, of, of our timeline, whatever that is, is given over to, you know, actually dividing it up into chunks. You can call them increments, iterations, stages, tranches, whatever you want. But we break that change up into actual deliverables, key outcomes that will make a difference, both tangible and behavioral. So let's give people a simple sort of roadmap like this. Um, let's divide that roadmap up into, you know, within their sort of sprints or sort of time boxes where people can actually um, get the work done. Um, let's keep it as, as simple as possible so that everybody's going, well, this is easy to follow. And I didn't need to be an expert in either change or um, project management to actually sort of make this happen. Um, I think we can boost this with really simple skills, things like um, uh, the Moscow prioritization technique. 
um, and actually building that muscle where people are very good at looking at all the things they might be able to do and actually hone in on the things that actually deliver the greatest value. So what is a must have? I do an exercise with my groups a lot, which is around, right, let's just take a couple of minutes and brainstorm our to-do list. Right, if you could only pick one of those things, which comes back to the person who talked about a balance between work and life, if you could only fit in one of those things before the end of the week, which one would you pick? And, and let's debate the reasons why, so that people practice actually picking out the things that deliver the greatest benefit, that make the most difference, and don't beat themselves up about the fact that they have to cover everything on their to-do list because they can recognize that there are some things in there um, that they, yes, they should be doing, but there are others that are could haves. And in fact, there are quite a few ideas that probably could be categorized as won't have this time uh, because they're, they're nice ideas, but they're just not that relevant. And so these are very simple sort of structural techniques that people can use to sort of get a grip on the overwhelming feelings that they're actually dealing with. Um, the mind mapping technique I was talking about in terms of boosting my motivation um, is the benefits dependency network where we map, you know, if I automate a process that will take steps out of the process that will shorten the process so that um, we need less people to do the process. It takes less time. It costs us less money. It's a very simple. So that so that so that technique easy to do by anybody. Very intuitive. But what it does is it quickly pulls out of people's heads um, all the, the reasons why something would be worth doing. And of course, what we're looking for there is to use that as the sort of motivational tool. But also it helps them with their prioritization again, because when they start to realize what activities deliver the greatest benefits, they start to put those at the top of the list and they become a lot more confident about perhaps abandoning things that um, maybe you feel a guilt that you should be doing, but actually they don't deliver that much value and it's not the greatest use of your time. So I think there are a lot of structural skills, starting with how do we allocate whatever time frame in which we're going to make change? How do we make sure that we've sort of maybe divided that up? If I've got to sort of get something up and running in the next 10 weeks, how might I divide that up? What should I have achieved in the next two to three weeks? What should I achieve a couple of weeks after that? What should I achieve a couple of weeks after that? People don't need to know that that's based on the sort of the agile sort of time frame. They don't need to know necessarily all the technique, but they just need to understand that there is something in there that says, OK, this is a, a way of getting a bit of a grip. And therefore, I feel a bit more in control and therefore I feel a little less stressed. So I think there is something about both the structural and what we're going to look at now, which is the um, uh, the, the sort of the emotional intelligence, the, the, the skills piece that is actually a contributor to sort of mental health. So the skills piece, we've, we've been talking about this. It's about um, building your own uh, awareness, which is the, the, sort of the starting point of any emotional intelligence. Um, Self-awareness um, leads to self-management. Um, because you can take the decision if you understand how you come across to others and how you behave, whether you want to tune yourself up or down a little bit, depending on what's going on. And a lot of techniques around personal leadership, how we can build our sort of social capital, uh, how we can get um, more authority, not hierarchical authority, but that people will listen to what we have to say and be more willing to sort of follow our lead because we're coming across as, as credible, reliable and trustworthy. Um, and then from an environmental point of view, um, can we create a sort of local culture that provides sort of reassurance, encouragement and motivation for ourselves and for those around us? So I think there's a lot we can do in terms of those um, emotional skills. Um, we can look at um, deconstructing, you know, uh, when you're sort of um, trying to engage with somebody and you're trying to build a relationship that perhaps um, some active listening skills, when you fully focus uh, and you walk in the shoes of somebody who's talking to you and you really listen, how much better your relationship is, how the trust builds up 
and actually that there are practical things that you can do to build trust. Active listening is one of them, uh, but also things like um, doing what you said you were going to do and repeatedly doing that so that actually a consistency and a regularity builds up. Um, being versed in your own values, understanding what is acceptable behavior and what isn't to you and holding true to that. You know as well as I do the people we don't trust are the ones that have good days and bad days because you take the same problem to them on two different days and you get two very different reactions. That does not lead to trust. So I think there's there's enough out there that we can actually build um, a very simple sort of skills transference in building up people's emotional intelligence um, and, and therefore creating the empathy um, that they need to, to get others to sort of want to follow their lead. So I think whenever we're looking at what are the latest trends in change management, um, I think we've developed because I think we know that there's both the structural and the sort of the skills piece that we have to bring together. And we know that this balance is incredibly important. Um, if we sort of, we're, we're back to sort of um, uh, run the business um, and change the business. So we know that people are already sort of straddling that. But the things I've just talked about in getting that balance of structure and skills together is the organization and the individual gains a reduction in stress. You know, it stops us pretending that all roles remain unchanged. As the pace of change has increased, we have demanded that staff develop an ability to lead themselves and others through change, but perhaps we haven't reflected this in their job descriptions and the way performance is managed. So we expect them to do both of these, but only maybe recognize their um, achievements in run the business. Um, and I think that what we can do with the structural and the skills piece is we are actually training them for the role that we've been expecting them to perform for the last God knows how many years. I think we can also reduce stress because we are explicitly stating what skills are needed, what behaviours are needed to lead themselves and others through change, rather than expecting people to sort of stumble across those skills by accident or hoping that actually they are so, you know, so much a people person that they have those natural abilities. Um, I think we should be able to step back and say, do you know what? This is a this is a skill. This is a competency, and we should be developing those skills and competencies in people. Um, and we need to sort of accept that in the 21st century, you know, everybody's trying to to straddle the let me improve what I'm doing as well as deliver what I'm doing. So people are, have that natural stress and we acknowledge that that you know and, and we give support for that so this reduces risk so we are talking about reducing stress but we're talking about reducing risk as well we're reducing risk that staff are so overwhelmed that they quit that they will they would rather put effort into finding another job where they think that the balance is going to be better or the risk that actually they take lots of unplanned absences and sick leave because frankly, they just cannot cope. And of course, we also increase the, the financial benefits if we can get this skills training right. If we can get structure and the emotional skills training, democratize it out to all of those who are impacted by change, then we're gonna achieve the benefits much quicker. We're gonna come up that transition curve much quicker. So I passionately believe that change management is a men there's a huge number of mental health benefits. But, you know, I'm enough of a capitalist to recognize that those mental health benefits do something rather fantastic for the bottom line of an organization, because it means that we get the change that we want in place as soon as we can. So we get earlier and increased return on investment um, and we reduce the costs of all the problems that we run into. Um, there's a, a, a great book by Stephen R. Covey who talks about the, um, the cost to a business of a loss of trust, because what we do is we duplicate activities and we put in lots more checks and balances. So there's a lot uh, more supervisory cost to doing anything. And I'm thinking that we probably ought to write the book that says, you know, um, the, the, the cost of not having change management to a business is absolutely huge. 
I mean, one of the obvious things is if we manage change really badly, as we know, we spend an awful lot of time firefighting and trying to um, put out negative rumours rather than actually being able to get on with the new ways of working. So the sooner we start sort of putting this on the curriculum of all management development programmes, that it becomes part of our sort of graduate induction um, and onboarding of any staff member, um, the better, I think, for the organisational sort of health. Who needs these skills? Well, I think knowing that 50% of you have come from the sort of project and program management background, recognizing that on, on the left here, we have all of those sort of in the natural hierarchy who are in run the business. And then there are those of us on the sort of on the professional side who are, you know, I put the project manager there doing both the, um, the structural and the behavioral change pieces. But you know, we've got professionals who are there. We hire people to work as business analysts and developers um, and project team members to get the deliverables created. Um, but of course, to uh, achieve, you know, this, this uh, tangible change, we need those dedicated project resources, but we also need to draw on our colleagues in the business and their real world experience. So really what we're doing is we're trying to train this hybrid team which is both the, the, the project side and those from the business. And I think when it comes to change management, um, we need to sort of recognise that, you know, everybody's time poor. Um, so maybe they haven't got time for all the theoretical theories and models. I mean, I'm an old academic at heart and I could lecture for days on all the theories and models of change. Um, but actually, let's cut to the chase. People need to know what to do and how to do it. They need the practical techniques. And, and frankly, they don't necessarily want to become experts outside of their field. Um, so if they happen to be a finance manager, they don't suddenly want to become, you know, a dedicated change professional. Um, they love their job, but they recognise that they perhaps do want to make, you know, change happen um, uh, and, and be better at it. Um, so we, we really need to sort of cut to the chase. And. As I said, I'd come to the end of this webinar before I turn to your questions and say, for all of these reasons, this is why we've created the Agile Change Agent Qualification. Because whilst APMG has a fantastic change management qualification, the change management practitioner that does all the theories and models, and if you are uh, somebody who really loves change management, oh, that is the course for you. It's brilliant. A foundational sort of masterclass in all the things you need to know. But for this more hybrid audience that I'm talking about, we need to dive straight into the practical, not the theoretical. Um, and also reflecting the real world these days, that change is actually delivered in a very agile way. Again, they don't necessarily want to become an agile professional. Again, APMG has got a fantastic course, the Agile PM, that's got a great life cycle. It gets into the depths of all the responsibilities around change and all the um, uh, agile and all the activities around being agile. But if they don't want to become an agile expert, again, they need to know the basics of what that what agile means. It means iteration after iteration of change, doesn't it? Um, but they don't need to be an expert um, if they happen to have studied in either of those subjects, that's great. We can build on that knowledge, but we don't assume that it exists. But what the Agile Change Agent qualification does is it just explains in common sense, uh, in an intuitive and easy to digest way, how to run uh, a change initiative um, within your own team, how to move from this idea um, or the project deliverables that are coming your way into creating new ways of working and realizing the benefits off the back of that. So it's all about enabling people to be able to do something that they couldn't do before. So it's all about transferring ability, not just knowledge. This is not a reading aloud course. So it's all about the techniques, it's about the checklist, the questionnaires, the templates, and, and very much though the techniques and practicing those techniques. And I thought what I'd sort of leave you with, um, I couldn't sort of ignore, um, uh, I, I could go in, I'm not gonna do a big sales pitch on, on the Agile Change Agent course. What I wanted to do with this webinar is sort of bring us all up to speed on maybe what's really happening and, and the, the need for democratization of, of change management skills. Um, and I thought I'd leave you with this little network, the, the benefits dependency network for building an internal capability for change. 
which I think um, the Agile Change Agent course is at the forefront of doing, um, because I think it really does give people who don't want to be an expert in either Agile or Change uh, a really easy entry into gaining the practical ability to make change happen wherever they are in the organization. So that's why I'm so pleased um, to be associated with it. And I'm going to hand over to Estelle, who I know has got a few questions for me. Um, believe me, we will finish no later than on the hour, because I know that everybody's got back to back meetings, whichever part of the world they're in. So we'll, we'll stick to deliver on time. So Estelle, anything you want to pose for me? Thank you. Would you like to have a drink of water, Mel? <laughs> Are you always, you amaze me. You amaze me. Thank you very much indeed. That's a, a, a brilliant presentation. Thank you. Right. First of the questions. Um, so uh, someone's saying some of the staff are out of the country on vacation um, and stuck in lockdown at the moment. It's difficult due to the the huge time differences in the time zones. Um, and how would you handle this? Well, I'll be I'll give you a very practical answer. I'm a pragmatist at heart. Um, so, for example, uh, my colleagues in the US and on the West Coast, um, what I'm actually doing is I'm doing a course um, <laughs> online that covers their time zone. Um, so um, uh, I'm starting around four o'clock in my time zone and I'm finishing around midnight. I don't think my family are going to be too charmed. Um, but I think that just gives you an example of how um, when it comes to I mean, I work all over the world, starting in Auckland and I work all the way across to San Francisco. So I, I rarely sleep. Um, but I think it's just being a, a little bit flexible. Um, I was working with somebody the other day who worked throughout the night. Um, so she started at 10 p.m. and she finished at 4.30 a.m. Um, because we were working together and she was chosen to, to work a European day. So. I do think, you know, um, there are ways around this. Um, I've also done something for um, a group in Australia where um, uh, what I'm doing is um, uh, I'm, I'm giving up sort of perhaps my time in that I'm getting up very, very early in the morning uh, to, to meet the back end of their working day. And what I'm doing is I'm doing a couple of hours for them um, uh, at, at sort of the, my crack of dawn. And what we've done is we've divided the training over an, um, uh, in fact, it's sort of, um, uh, four sessions a week for two weeks, so Monday through Thursday. Um, so they start Monday evening and finish Thursday evening, and I start Monday morning and finish Thursday morning. Um, so I, I just think from a practical point of view, it's just, you know, it's time. I'm sure we can chunk it up in some way that works for everybody. Does that help or does it make me seem like I never sleep? <laughs> <laughs> bit of give and take. I'll, I'll wait for them to, to pop an answer in there, but I'm going to um, carry on with the next question, if I may. Um, so Angela's saying, how do we deal with multiple changes happening all at the same time at inside and outside of our control? Great question. Oh, yes. Well, we are takers of change, aren't we? I mean, and there's an awful lot of change being imposed upon us and we don't even see coming. Um, I come back to this one here because I think that if, if you look at an individual change and you can sort of say over the next three months, I need to make X happen and you can use this timeline so you can divide that time frame up into chunks and you can clearly state when your outcomes are going to be delivered. So what capability will be in place wave after wave of change? If you can keep to this really simple structure, when you've got multiple changes, one of the most impactful things you can do is you apply exactly the same structure to all of them. Now, what happens is that, of course, what you've got um, iterations of change, waves of change ending, starting and ending at different times. And, and you can almost feel the body blows of capability a, a new capabilities, new things coming on stream day after day after day. You know, I've got one where I've got 11 changes all sort of stacked up um, and but I've used exactly the same framework. So by doing that, I can clearly see when I'm going to be most likely impacted. So I think it comes back to keep the structure really simple and apply it to every single change wherever the change came from. Ask key questions about delivery dates and when we're supposed to create new ways of working and then just stack it like this. And I think you'll find that really helps. Very simple, very practical, but it, you can draw it up as a sort of big list and then you know when you're being hit by things. Thanks, Mel. Um, OK, Stefan saying uh, thank you for all this great info. I know you'll like that. Quite a few people are saying that actually, Mel, so you're getting lots of great oh. feedback here. Um, uh, and Stefan saying, 
his question is being in um, a more agile mode and reducing the long-term vision seems to bring much more pressure on delivery in your experience how does capacity come into play when delivering change activities so i think um i'm just trying to go back to here um just to to keep an eye on the fact that we've you know the time frame is much shorter i've got two parts of that answer um number one is that um i think that we should even though the time frame has shortened um i spent a lot of this morning talking to a group about the importance of still asking the bigger question, which is, how do you think we will be working in a year's time or two years time? What do you think the bigger picture is? And making sure that we keep asking our leaders, but also coming up with our own ideas of what do we think things will look like in a couple of years time? So that when we're dealing with shorter time frames, we can sort of assimilate back to that bigger picture, because I think as human beings, we like to do that. And that bigger picture becomes the anchor point at which we can sort of put things in context and go, oh, OK, I, I get where I'm heading now. Um, so it, and you can do the same with your own career development, to be honest, because you think, well, in three years time, where will I be working? Maybe what kind of job might I be doing? Um, and therefore, maybe what in the short term are the things that are most important to me? So I think that end goal is quite important. Um, I think in answer to your resourcing question, again, I'm going to come back to the time frame one that I've just used and say, if you stack all of these sort of roadmaps, one on top of the other, that sets out sort of what's happening change wise, um, and you just start to map on there who's impacted. I think, you know, as a human being, if you get past sort of three or four, which are all impacting the same people, I think you already know that you've got overload. But it's, again, a really quick way I can draw those up. Um, in a board meeting and just sort of stack them, if you like, stack them and rack them, as they call it, um, to actually see all the different changes. And I can just point out to the board, stop having ideas or kill off some of your existing ideas if you want this new idea to take place, because people are overwhelmed. And, and I think there's something in there about visually actually sort of being able to do that. So some kind of heat mapping would be a good idea. OK. Uh, okay. Probably another question or two, maximum. Some, sorry, time. Mel. Yeah, we've got. I, I think three more. They keep um, okay. keep adding in. Well, I'll stay um, online. Uh, but those <laughs> please, you can always pose questions to me afterwards via LinkedIn or Melanie at AgileChangeManagement.co.uk. So I'll stay online then, Estelle. Off you go. <laughs> okay. I will. Um, I will make sure that we uh, send your contact details um, out to everybody. Can I? Can I? Can Can I? Can we do one last one before? Yeah. No. Don't go ahead. Yeah, go okay. and ask all the questions you want to ask. Okay. So this one um, uh, is quite a vulnerable question, I think, and and I think this is really, really brave of you to say. So thank you very much. I'm not going to do a name. She's saying she'd like to understand whether the Agile Change Agent qualification is appropriate for leadership as opposed to management level learners. Is there a qualification more suited to a VP director level learners, i.e. been driving leading change for a number of years, but doesn't have any qualifications? I think that's a great question. Well, if you have been leading change and you really want to dig into a change as a specialist subject, I absolutely recommend the change management practitioner. I love that syllabus. Um, it's aligned to the body of knowledge of the Change Management Institute. And I'm sure Estelle won't mind me saying about it, even though we're talking about Agile Change Agent. However, I will say that I have trained the Agile Change Agent to um, CEOs and the board, and they've all learned something. They've all found it absolutely gripping. Um, but I've also trained it to people who know absolutely nothing about change, and they found it equally as useful um, and have learned new things, but they've learned different things. So I, th I think, you know, that there's enough in there that people can sort of open to interpretation. Um, but if you really want to sort of dig in and say, do you know what, I'm an expert in change, I can't recommend the change management practitioner enough. I think it's a great course. Brilliant. Thank you, Mel. OK. Um... Salem says, "Do the skills uh, can the skills be learnt, or is it is it a personality? And what if we are very directive? Can this be changed?" 
Yes, it can. These skills can be learned. You can learn to moderate your behaviour. Um, and I think the relationship building part of the Agile Change Agent course I'm most proud of, because I think that it actually gives you a chance to, to think about how you come across to others, how others interpret how you um, engage with them. And you can take choices. Uh, one of the ways that we can build our leadership capability is through uh, remaining flexible in how we approach situations, but also some self-control that if I um, if I'm tired and I'm grumpy and I don't apply self-control then I'm going to be short and snappy with you um, whereas if I apply self-control and sort of say well I might be tired but that's not that's not anybody else's fault um, let me remain as patient as I can be it's a choice isn't it and I, I think absolutely these it, these skills are all rooted in First of all, your self-awareness and then your willingness to self-manage, which is at the heart of emotional intelligence. So I absolutely passionately believe leaders can be made. They don't have to be born with a certain set of personality traits. OK, and this really is the last one now, Mel. OK, okay. <laughs> um, what change do you see as coming in terms of skills and habits post COVID-19? Um, I've been writing recently um, on virtual leadership um, and virtual management, and I think um, that I'm leading a number of teams around the world, and I always have done, um, but um, I've also always been able to get on the plane to go and see them, um, to have lunch with them, uh, to work alongside them in the office, and to not have that option. And in the longer term, I'm working with a lot of clients who are saying there's no business travel into 2021. Um, I think that virtual leadership and the ability to manage ourselves and our time when we're online and it sort of feels unrelenting, uh, but also to be able to work effectively with people that maybe we've never met um, or have met but haven't seen for months um, is a very different skill set. And I think a lot of people are being really tested by it. So look out for more stuff. I'm going to keep writing about it. I'm, I think I'm doing a podcast on it in the, in the near future. So ha, we will. All right. On that then, because we did run out of time and that was my fault, not yours, Mel, because you tried ever so hard. So I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, we will follow up um, with uh, details of the qualifications as well and this set of slides and Mel's direct uh, contact details as, as well as other places that you can uh, achieve uh, training around the globe so thank you very very much for everyone for joining in and engaging and I will leave the last words to you before I close the uh, webinar Mel thank you well if you thought this was useful and you thought oh I wish my colleague had heard about this I'm doing this again tomorrow at eight o'clock UK time so in about 12 hours time I'm doing it all over again so um, you could send them the recording or you could tell them to join in live so if they want to join me tomorrow morning at eight o'clock UK time Take care, guys. Have a good evening or morning, depending on where you are.